praise God for a blessed time in worship together. Um, if there's one thing that I have um, noticed this year is people have gotten very passionate about concerts. Um, Maranatha last week, I've never seen it so insanely packed. Uh, same with uh, last night here. Um, doesn't matter who it is, it's just, I guess, that time of the year. Um, the same way we like to go see Christmas lights. Um, it's just um, part of uh, part of the tradition, I guess, um, and it's nothing um, that I'm bothered about at all. Um, it's just a blessing to be able to speak again um, from the Word of God, and it's a message that um, that the Lord has touched uh, my heart with that I've been praying alongside. Um, so um, it's it's something that I hope um, everyone tonight can uh, can join along with me as we kind of begin to look into. Um, the story of, of Jesus again, and I kind of want to uh, go a little bit back before um, Jesus' birth. Uh, if you guys don't mind, please stand along with me. I want to read from Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 26. Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 26 to 56. And it says, In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to me, came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked upon the humble he has looked on the humble estate of his servant, for behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Amen. You may be seated. Um, there's so many different, so many different sections, um, passages and, and preachings that are done um, this time on these passages um, and all these different uh, metaphoric examples, and there's so much um, richness in the Word of God, and, and it's amazing how no matter how many times um, the words are preached on, there's so many things that we can grasp um, from all these verses, from all these passages, and, and it's amazing to see the Word of God just living and active, um, and always touching our hearts and stirring us in a new way um, at 
31 years old, how many Christmases um, that I've, messages that I've actually, you know, listened to. Um, it's something that the Lord is continuing to speak to me through and challenge me um, and open up my heart um, to, to what the Lord is, what the Lord is saying and, and the perspective that we should have um, in, in this time of the year. And, and the focus that I want to talk about tonight is kind of uh, mostly on, on Mary and Joseph and just how, how everything kind of just landed at this, at this certain time. You know, a lot of times you look at Christmas as it's supposed to end up in December 25th, and that's, you know, how we align it where Christmas Day or where Jesus was actually born. Um, I'm sure Frater Valer has all the details on the historical evidence of when the day actually was and whatnot. Um, but when you're thinking about at that time and everything that they're going through, um, it wasn't like they had to reach a certain day. It wasn't like they had to, you know, make it to this type of cutoff and this type of deadline. Um, but the Lord um, timed everything exactly as he wanted for a greater purpose. Um, we see um, a, young, a young couple looking to be betrothed. And, and, and of course, all of the excitement and the anticipation, everything that is going on, it's this big shift that's going to happen in their life. And 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 I'm sure they were just anticipating everything, all the organization, and um, you know Joseph excited to finally have a wife, and Mary finding that good husband, and and the complete shift of of their expectations just multiplied in such a variety of ways. And and as I was sitting there pondering um, on the story of Mary and Joseph, wondering, Lord, why did you you know do it at this time and align it in this way? Couldn't you have? maybe waited a little bit for them to be more set up? Couldn't you have done it in a different way where, where things weren't so chaotic, where they didn't have to do this long journey, where they didn't have to, you know, figure all these different things out? Um, but I want to, in the four points that I want to make tonight was, was the way that the Lord worked these things for His good, and, and He had a purpose behind it, and I'm sure there's more than four points that we can pull, but four that spoke to me that kind of um, challenged me in in. in in the way I, I've been praying lately, and the, and the Lord's been aligning my heart, and um, just kind of the innocence in Mary and Joseph, um, and the shift that happens in their life, and, and the first and foremost thing it talks about is, is the angel coming to Mary, um, and it says in verse 28, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you, and at the end of verse 30, it says, you have found favor with God. So the first point I want to make tonight is, does your lifestyle find favor with the Lord? Do the things that we do find favor with God, the things that we do behind closed doors? And I was sitting there thinking, for the Lord to come and say, you have found favor with God was something mighty. You know, a lot of times in, in today's day and age, we're so easy to fluff up our words. You know, it's so easy to say, hey, you're awesome. Hey, you're so amazing. Hey, you're, you're this and you're that. And just a lot of fluff in today's day and age. And, and when you see it in the word of God, it says, oh, favored one. There's no fluff there. It's authentic. It's from God. Everything that God does, you know, it's, when you go through the Bible and it says, you know, this person was beautiful or this person was honest or this person was meek, you know that the Lord's doing it in complete accuracy. Um, or even, you know, when you have Esau it says he was hairy, I was like, man, if the Lord says he was hairy in the Bible, like, you know, it was uh, very authentic. And as we see here in, in the favor of Mary, someone young someone getting ready to be married, right? Especially, you know, the example of a lot of young girls today waiting for that chapter and a lot of times thinking, you know, once, once I get married, um, once I have my family, you know, I'll grow with the Lord. And Mary, before she's even married, and, and who knows how young she is, you know, tradition back then is they were married at a much younger age, but she was someone that was living a life that found favor with the Lord. And to find favor with God is doing the right things behind closed doors, to find favor with the Lord is having my heart in the right place, is understanding that I'm focused on the things above instead of the things around me, and understanding she was somebody who probably honored her parents. She was someone who had good relationships. She was someone who was not caught up in all the drama. She was somebody who was, who was meek. She was somebody to find favor with God is something that, that can just be a message on its own to understand what do I need to do in my life to find favor with God? And as I've been praying and been convicted these last few weeks preparing for this message, my prayer was like, Lord, let me live a life that finds favor with you. In everything that I do, may I live a life that you can say, oh, favored one. And he, and he says it twice, you have found, oh, favored one. And again, Mary, you have found favor with God. 
And, and we all talk about how we want on that, on that final day to say, good and faithful servant, right? For the Lord to say, hey, you found favor with me. That's my, that should be, as a Christian, our utmost desire. What we strive for, what we long for, the things that we seek, because we're really good at seeking favor with man. We're really good at trying to do all these things. Well, if I do this, people are going to look at me this way. Or in my workplace, you know, there's all the ways that you try to find favor with your boss. You know, a lot of kissing up, a lot of different things to try to move up the ladder. But to find favor with God is something that's authentic. It's something that it's real and it's focused on the things that are not superficial. And it says, you know, it talks about mercy for those who fear him. And, and I love Mary's song of praise. Um, so many powerful things in, in, in this section where Mary's just talking about all these things where the Lord stirs at her heart and, and this mighty moment and this young girl who, you know, we, we look at this, we look at this prayer and we kind of just read over it and we're like, amen, amen. But to understand the perspective coming from this young girl who's not yet married, who doesn't have some type of schooling, some type of, you know, studying the word of God, but she has these profound things in her in her, in her song of praise, and it's the Holy Spirit inspiring her and working in her. And, and, and the concept is if, if us, no matter what the age, if we're living a lifestyle and finding favor with God, the Lord will, will open up things in our hearts and show us such mighty, powerful things. It says in, in 46, it says, My soul magnifies the Lord. And, and, under, and she was just so so overwhelmed by finding favor with God. And, and it says in, in um, talk, going a little bit further back from what I read in, in, in Matthew 19 to 25, um, even there it talks about, you know, the, the, the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And as Father Lord kind of touched upon this morning, they were found righteous before the Lord. And my desire for us as Christians is understanding is, is, is everything that I do, everything that I, every decision that I make, does it find favor with God? Do I seek those things? Do I seek to exalt Him? It says in, in the prayer, it says in 50, it says, And His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. To find favor with God is to be someone that has a fear of the Lord. And to have a fear of the Lord, the Lord brings mercy. And His mercy renews us and, and it marks us. And, and, and it's, so, it's so tough in today's day and age because especially in, in, in the young generation, the things that were influenced to desire, the things we're influenced to chase after are the complete opposite of the things that find favor with God. We chase the things that make us look good on, on social media. We chase the things that make us look good to our friends. And the world is tailored in a way where you have to chase a certain type of pattern of life to be worth something, to have some type of value. But it says his mercy is for those who fear him. And, and <coughs> it's, it's interesting how in this young generation we see, you know, in many churches kind of making the shift of different styles from what was more traditional to what was more, you know, to what is, what is relevant today. Hey, um, why do we do this in church and why do we do, do, we do that? And, and a lot of young people today um, like to question everything. Hey, why do we do this in church? Why is it like this? Why is it like that? Why do we have this tradition? Why do we have that? Um, this doesn't make sense. We don't do this. Where in the Bible does it say that I need to go to church, you know, twice on a Sunday? Where in the Bible does it say that I need to be a part of a body of believers? Where in the Bible does it say, and, and trying to get justification for everything. But the honest truth is they can't give any justification for the lifestyle that they're living. And it's easy for us to ask for justification on every little aspect. But when the Lord is asking us justification for the way I live my life, we probably would get real quiet. Why does it get like this? Why does it get like that? And, and, and I want us to pray that, that this would be a desire for not just for our young people, for, but for us as a church Everything that I do, do I find favor with the Lord? And is that my, is that my kind of what my fuel for the way I live my life? The second point that um, kind of started um, this whole message for me was, um, do we care more about the setup than the Savior? A lot of um, young, young couples, even older couples, um, regardless um, of, of where they are, stage of life, 
are so focused on, on the setup of, of, of life, the house, the cars, the lifestyle, um, the vacation, the toys, and all, this, all these other things. And, and a lot of young people, as, as you just hear them in conversation, right, as I, as I go through a youth event and, and I just, you know, kind of hear conversations happening between this group and that group and that group, the different things that we're chasing that they're aspiring for. Everybody wants the nice setup, right? Oh, I would love to have this type of car. I would love to have this type of life, this type of lifestyle. Um, and, and as I look in, in, in Mary and Joseph, um, the beautiful thing that I saw is it wasn't, the Lord wasn't finding a young couple that was set up from the world's mindset, that had everything up in line, that was, you know, all, all their, you know, chickens were in the pen, everything was lined up, the farm was good, everything was lined up. You know, we go back to, um, the Old Testament, we see Abraham, and everyone's like, oh, look at Abraham. He had all these riches, and everything was dialed, and the Lord began to use him, um, you know, which a lot of people like to use when they're kind of on that chasing the, the very well-off lifestyle. Um, but Mary and Joseph were, as far as we know, more on the common side. Not exactly, you know, just abundant in their finances, abundant in all the things, but um, they were focused on 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 the Savior and... It says in, in Mary's prayer, it says at the end of in verse 51, it says, He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. Too focused on, on where can I get more pride in my life? What, what things do I aspire for or chase for so that I can be proud of the setup that I have? So I can be proud of the house that I have, so I can be proud of the car I drive, so I can be proud of the lifestyle I live, so I can be proud of the vacations that I post on social media, so I can be proud of the outfits that I have, so I can be proud of this. It says, scattered the proud in the thoughts of their heart. And in verse 52, he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. It says, he has sent the rich away hungry, or sent, sent the rich away empty. Um, and he has filled the hungry with good things. And understanding, you know, we, we see so many rich people just committing suicide or falling on some type of overdose. A lot of times they like to wait with the news um, to not expose the fact that they committed suicide or drug themselves down to death because they had everything. And in everything, it was complete emptiness and nothing. Right. It's like it's like every other month there's this new article that comes out about this person who was in complete depression, whatever, and just decides to call it quits on their lifestyle. And understanding, you know, he has filled the hungry with good things, but understanding what to hunger for, what to desire, what to chase. And, 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 and a lot of times we get so consumed on, on the setup that we're chasing. And, and I saw it as soon as, as soon as I got married, it's, it's so easy to fall into that mentality of like, what is the lifestyle and the setup that I want to have? What do I want to chase? What do I want to grind for? What do I want to work for and, 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 and be completely, you know, consumed by? And I see a lot, of, a lot of young people, a lot of young families, a lot of young couples my age consumed with the setup of the lifestyle, obsessed with what they're trying to aspire, chasing all of the other things. And then they just kind of want to add a little bit of Jesus to the side and be like, well, the Lord's blessing me. I still do my little thing. But at the end of the day, the focus that I have, the way that I'm consumed is all about the setup and not the Savior. The decisions that I make are inspired by setting me and my family up. There's a lot of young families that came to America and did everything they could to set their family up. And kids my age overdosed on drugs, no longer with the family. Parents, you know, completely destroyed over who they married, the families that they got into. And you would go, and there was a family that I remember, I, I drove by their house, and from the perspective that you would look, you would say, hey, they made it. They have everything they want. They have the beautiful land. They have the nice garage. They have the car sitting in the garage. And from the outside, it's like they made it all the way. They have the setup that I would love to have. But getting to know them in deep pain and sorrow because their kids are nowhere to be found. Because they've entered in all these marriages with people that have nothing to do with the Lord, have no desire to be in the house of the Lord, have nothing. And inside of their setup is misery. And it's a very slippery slope because that's the way the world is tailored. And that's the map that, that the world is trying to give us. Hey, chase the setup. Hey, set yourself up. Focus on you and your family. 
Don't worry about anybody else. Don't worry about the church. Take care of you and your family and set yourselves up so that you're comfortable. And a lot of times we even get to that, that false conception is like once I'm set up financially, then I can serve the Lord. I just need five, seven years to grind and set myself up and then I can serve full and, and, and all out. I can do all of these things. I can donate to missionaries. I can do all of these things once I'm set up. And if you're not serving the Savior through the setup, then you're just focusing on the setup instead of the Savior. And it's something that we have to be very aware of and, and be very focused on our young kids and see what they desire. Even I tell this to the young people a lot, when you're talking to someone about getting married, you need to ask them, what do you see as a successful lifestyle? What do you see as, as a setup that you want to be? What do you aspire? What do you imagine? Right? And there's, there's a lot of... In, in the last five years, there have been more um, young couples in the Romanian community that have already got engaged, had the engagement, and before the wedding, broke it off, understanding that the lifestyle that she wanted and he wanted didn't correlate. And, and it's like, well, did, didn't you guys talk about that already? Didn't, didn't these discussions already happen? But overwhelmed by the cloud of love and, and all of these things, even in Mary and Joseph, I'm sure there was all these butterflies and roses of we're going to get married or whatever, and, and all of this excitement and breaking it off and understanding, is the person that I'm talking to desiring the same thing? Does he or she desire the Savior or is she just here for the setup? My third point, um, and this is something that we see so powerfully in the story of Mary and Joseph is God's timing is focused on your character, not on your comfort and convenience. And we're all familiar with the story of, of you know, there's, there's the big census and, and they have to, you know, travel all this time and Mary's so far along um, and in her pregnancy and all of these different things are going on and, and, um, I think every lady in this place would say that when they were um, eight months, nine months pregnant, traveling is not really something you're looking forward to, right? Riding a donkey for miles, not exactly a great time, right? Not, a, not really a time where, you know, you see all these pictures where, you know, Joseph's carrying them on a donkey and there's this sparkle in their eyes because, you know, they're married. I don't think that's exactly how it was, right? And, and no offense to the ladies, but generally at nine months, the patience runs a little bit shorter, the comfort is much less, and there's all this inconvenience. And I'm thinking, okay, Lord, couldn't you have done that a little bit earlier? Couldn't you have called the census, you know, a little bit timelier, and maybe when she was just four months along or, or done it early, and then they just happened to stay, right? There's all these different ways that us from a human mindset could have changed the perspective. Yeah, we're like, oh, Lord, if you could just do it like this, you know, sometimes even in our prayers, we're like, Okay, Lord, here's the map, and I just need yes and amen to these requests. And, you know, if you say this, then I move to this next spot at work, and then I can do this, and then I can do that. And, and you know, and a lot of times, you know, the Lord's like, well, that's the, the, the message of the Lord is, well, that's not going to work on your character. That's your convenience, and that's your comfort, right? Yeah, you want, you want a stallion, but in the end, you're, you're going with the donkey. And, 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 and we think so many times like, well, God, you could, have, you could have done it in a better way. But the Lord was changing their character through it on that long journey. I'm sure they had a lot of thoughts, a lot of deep talks, a lot of questioning. Okay, Lord, you said I'm this favored one. Blessed are you and you're going to have this right as soon as she says, you know, it says blessed are you and here's how it's going to happen, everything. And Mary has this song of praise and she visits um, I don't know how well she was singing that song of praise on that journey. It's very tough, right? We're in the flesh. We, we're humans. We were weak. We have, we have struggles. There's worries of, of people getting abducted, right? It's not just, you know, get into our nice SUV and cruise down to L.A., right? There's this long journey. It's inconvenience. You don't have everything. And, and focusing on, on the convenience and the comfort is, is the mindset of so many Christians. I'll serve when it's convenient, I'll do what's for the Lord when it's comfortable. I'll do everything that I want out of my convenience, right? You have a lot, of, a lot of friendships that fail because they're only willing to meet up when it's convenient for them. But what you understand in growing older is if the friends that are the closest to you are the ones that are willing to meet up, not just when it's convenient, 
right? The friends that are willing to be there, not when it's just a comfortable and I just have a day of open plans, but you make sacrifices, you make adjustments because there's this group that you want to be with. Same way for your family. You know, a lot of things that we do for our kids out of comfort and convenience, mm, you know, it's, it's easy to, it's, it's like all those pictures you see, especially now in the Christmas holidays um, of the family and everything's sweet and everything's mellow and there's this beauty, but the reality is behind all those pictures was chaos, was screaming. Uh, I remember last year we were walking down to the river to take pictures and, and I was holding Eli and as soon as I put him down, I was like, don't run, literally 10 seconds, runs, boom, smashes his lip, bleeding, he's crying, falling apart. It's like, man, I'm, <laughs> I'm really excited for these pictures. <laughs> You know, and you send the card out, and it's like, oh, such a beautiful family. And you think back, I was like, yeah, it wasn't exactly a beautiful moment. But a lot of times, you know, it says, it says in Mary's prayer, it says, He has exalted those of humble estate. And the honest truth is that's not really something that, that our young people are willing to associate themselves with. I don't want to proclaim from the rooftops my humble estate. I want to proclaim my nice car. I want to proclaim my nice outfits. I want to proclaim my setup. I want to proclaim this and I want to proclaim that. But to, to associate myself with somebody that is humbly, somebody that has a low estate, is not really bringing a huge line. right? It's not really something that's very enticing to a lot of people. But it says those are the people that he exalts. Those are the people that he's working on. That's where the character is formed. And that's where it's stirred up. And... In 47, it says, My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. He has looked upon my, on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. And, and we're familiar with how, you know, even in, in the Catholic realm, they go a little bit too excessive on the Virgin Mary and the blessing. And it's, it's you know, they've gone to the other extreme. But we see how... All generations called blessed of, of Mary, and she was acknowledging that all the way then because she knew exactly what the Lord was doing and how He was exalting her and how He was forming her character and how He was shaping her and how He was shifting her. And um, a lot of times, you know, it's, it's, this, it's this easy uh, lip service, um, and it's, it's something that we've gotten so good at in today's day and age, especially in America. You know, everything has to be politically correct, and everything you fluff up, and you know, when you jump on those work meetings, everybody's talking about kids. When your boss is talking about, you have to throw up a smile because she's talking about her kids. And you don't want to sit there and be cranky. And she's just, you know, and you do all of this little fluff and you go through the motions. And, 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 and it says, you know, the, the one who is mighty has done great things. Holy is his name. Mercy for those who fear. He has shown strength with his arm, scattered the proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. And it says that he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And how when the Lord remembers the mercy, we've all experienced those times in our life, right? When we're going through difficult times and the Lord, you know, gives us kind of, it's like, Lord, you remembered me again. You, you've looked upon my estate and you've poured out mercy and it's, it's this beautiful time where it's like, it's, it's not just lip service, it's not just me singing a song, but you feel it inside. You feel exactly what the Lord has done. You feel the blessing. You feel what he's, you feel the, the power of his presence. And it's something that's so powerful. And it's, it's about the, allowing the Lord to, to form and shape our character when it's not convenient, when it's not comfortable. And if I'm willing to, to, to be shifted by God? Am I willing to go through the inconvenience? As Mary and Joseph are going, you know, through this long, um, through this long journey and, and, and wondering, you know, Lord, what are you going to do through all these things? And, and even when um, they come and they, you know, do all, say all these things above their son, the shepherds come and, and I don't want to steal someone else's sermon, but the shepherds come and, and the Magi, and it says all the time that Mary kept all these things in her heart understanding that the Lord was doing something, that there was a character that was being built, that there was, you know, something far more that the Lord is, is chasing instead of the Lord giving you a comfortable life. I read this book years back that said, um, good, not God. And this author was talking about how he started this, this business and everything was flowing and he was succeeding and everything was going well. And everybody was saying, hey, 
the Lord's blessing is on you and everything's going well and this is the plan God has for you clearly because you're succeeding. But he still was left a little bit empty and he was wondering, you know, I, I understand everything's flowing, but I'm, I'm still, something's not right. And over the years, he began to understand that though it was good, though it was a nice lifestyle, it wasn't what God wanted with my life. And everything that was viewed as success from man's perspective, he threw it out and he reset. And he changed his lifestyle and he changed everything about him. And it has nothing to do with like, oh, we can't have a successful business. That's not what I'm preaching. But understanding where the Lord has different plans for each and every one of us. But the plan of the Lord is not to put you in your comfort and in your convenience. God's goal for us as, as, as families is not to get us to the most comfortable state and then be like, hey, guys, look how blessed I am. Come try Jesus so you can reach my comfort level. That's not the gospel that we're preaching. That's not the ministry that we desire. Hey, hey, come serve the Lord when it's convenient for you. Because the Lord, yes, it's, it's great. We see the Savior and he brings the gift of Jesus. But in the same way Mary and Joseph, as, as they were blessed and as they were favored by God, there were things they were inconvenienced by as we're following Jesus. As we're seeking for the Savior to be, you know, a great part of our lives, we will experience inconvenience. We will experience discomfort. But is the Savior worth it to you? Or am I only praising God when things are going well? And my fourth and final point is, submitting to God's plan is the greatest decision we can make. In verse 38 it says, And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And may that be our prayer in everything that the Lord is doing in our lives. Lord, I am your servant. Let it be according to your word. This is the situation I'm dealing with. I don't understand why things are going this way. I don't understand why, why it could be the church, it could be your job, it could be your family, it could be relationships. But let it be done to me according to your will. And, 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 and that, that submission is something that's so beautiful because, you know, we, we're, we're, good at, we're good at the vocal part of it, but the complete surrender to it. Right in the same way where, where we first when we first got married, you know, it's we bought the house three months after we got married, and there was you know all the stress of remodeling, and then you're living paycheck to paycheck trying to do the remodel because of course Romanians always have to make the house nicer. We can't ever take the house the way it is, um, and you know we open a few credit cards that have no interest, and you have 12 months to kind of recover, you know. And, and, and I remember you know Carol asked me, well, how are we going to make it? How are we going to do it? Just trust. Just trust, you know, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to take that, just leave it to me. That, that was very tough in the beginning, right? Because you just got married to this guy. Does he actually know what he's talking about? Or are we just, you know, because you hear of other people just going bankrupt and you hear of all these other things. And, it, and all the time I was like, don't worry, we're, we're going to get there. And I remember as soon as the interest on the credit card ran out, that's when we had the final payment and paid it in full. And it was like, you know, just, just follow the journey. But it's stressful. It's a lot of anxiety sleepless nights, a lot of worry. But the beautiful thing is the submission to God's plan is the greatest decision we can make because the character is being formed, because there's favor in the Lord, because there is, there is a beauty that is being found in His timing. There is a setup that He's trying to do in our hearts. Um, and I talked about kind of all generations will call me blessed. Um, and, and understanding that that in this life, though we have trials, the path of submission, regardless of the ups and downs, is going to be the closest to the Father and the most effective and purpose-driven life you will have. No matter how tough it gets, no matter how turbulent the waters, that path of submission will be your path of closeness to God. That's where the Lord is going to keep you under His wing. That's where the Lord is going to change you. That's where it's going to be um, a place of hope and a place of... Um, a place of blessing, and a lot of times um, the blessing of, of learning a lesson is not one we want to receive, but how many times is the one that we need? Lord, whenever I'm going, you know, when I'm going through a trial, Lord, what are you trying to teach me through this? I'm in my job. Um, I keep trying to move to the, to the next step up, and right now I'm basically taking turns at every department in the city of Sacramento getting a rejection and, you know, doing my grand tour all the way around, and a lot of times I make it to the final interview, um, and it's like, okay, Lord, what was the point of that? Just, just close, don't even send me the, you know, don't receive me for the interview. You know, I feel like I'm wasting my time. You know, it's like, what's the point? It's not like this, 
this grave situation that I'm dealing with in life, but it's just that honest prayer. Okay, Lord, well, here we go. Five times I've made it to the final round, and five times like, well, someone was just better than you. You know, tell me something new. You know, and the, the Lord is, is, you know, a lot of times it's like, well, are you, is, is my character shiftable? Am I moldable? Am I willing to be clay in the potter's hands? Am I too, is, is, is something that maybe there's pride in my life that needs to get destroyed? Maybe there's a type of, of uh, reliance that, that I'm trying to form that's apart from God. You know, part of me one time when I was praying, I was like, Lord, I don't get why we haven't had this, um, this breakthrough per sort. Not that, you know, we're struggling to make ends meet, but this breakthrough that, you know, we've both been doing our work and putting in the effort, you know. And then what caught me is like, okay, well, if you have that breakthrough, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do different? Just vacation more? As if I don't do that enough already. Like, are you just, just going to flex more of your money? What are you going to do different? In a sense, I was like, I mean, I'm not asking more to help others. I'm not asking for more to, because I want to donate to this missionary, but I'm short funds, or because I want to do more trips. or, you know. And, and the Lord kind of caught me in my sense of, you know, what are, what are you designing and what's the purpose behind it? And, and we see, you know, in, in this story, as, as Mary's going through, you know, the, the exciting news, she goes through to visit Elizabeth, and, and Elizabeth talks about the baby leaping in her womb from joy, which I don't know about you ladies, but I don't know if you can identify a jump, a leap for joy in your stomach. You know, usually it's like, oh, he kicked me again or, and, and whatnot, if the ladies know better, but the leap for joy was, how did she know that was inspired by the Holy Spirit? And there was this joy that overcame Elizabeth. And what I love, it says, um, at the end of verse 36, it says, And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. And what does that mean, who was called barren? Everybody associated Elizabeth with barrenness. That's what she was known as. That was her association Oh, if you're talking about somebody, hey, who are you talking about, Elizabeth? Which Elizabeth? The barren one. Right? And that's, that's what she was giving. That was her identity. And a lot of times we get identified with, with the things that aren't going right. You know, the person that's going through this, the person that's going through that, the person that's dealing with this situation. Um, but it says right after that, who was called barren? For nothing will be impossible with God. And you see the joy that Elizabeth goes through and she says, you know, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And I tell you, she didn't go through all those years of barrenness and ridicule. She wouldn't have experienced this joy and this fulfillment. In the same way that we see the Lord answer a prayer that we've been praying for years, it is so much sweeter, so much more amazing. You know, in the same way, if I'm starving, the food tastes even better. You know, a lot of times like, wow, this is the best cooking you've ever made. And your wife says, no, you're just hungry. And, and when we see the Lord answer a prayer, you know, we have all the stress and the Lord answers. It's like, oh, okay, I see why I went through that. Through that trial that lasted all these years, I learned this. I learned that. I learned all these things. And it was associated with her that she was called barren. Um, but her and Mary just have this beautiful moment where, you know, they just, they just are excited about what the Lord is doing in their lives. And my desire, for, especially for our young people, is, is for young people to get together and look what the Lord is doing through us. Look what the Lord is moving in our hearts. And as we desire for young people to be filled with the Spirit, for young people to get on fire for the Lord, you know, to have that connection with your friends, not that you're in the same hobbies, not that you're in the same interests, not that you, you know, found these different friend groups, but this association between you and I, look what the Lord is doing in our lives. As us as a church, look what the Lord is doing in victory. Look what the Lord is stirring. And we had a, our final youth night on Wednesday, and I was, you know, I almost had it was a rebuke and encouragement. However, they wanted to receive it on Wednesday. But my desire was like, look, guys, I love all the fellowship that we have. I love that we can get along. But at the end of the day, if we're not encouraged by the presence of the Lord, if we're not united by the move of the Spirit, this is all vanities. And what are we chasing? What are we desiring? Because the perspective that I had was like, okay, if, if, if you could go talk to your younger self, what would you give yourself advice for? 
And we have a lot of times other people giving us advice, other people preaching to us from situations that they've been through, but we don't want to receive it. A lot of times we only, have, we can, we only want to learn on our own skin. But the Lord is, is calling us to desire these things, to desire you know, these moments where we're united through the move of God. Hey, I, I see what the Lord has done in your family. Look what he's done in mine. And this unity that you, you can't buy that type of unity. I remember when I was, when we'd go to prayer nights and we'd have all these, um, you know, it was like seven days straight. And you have those people that were always in the front praying alongside with you. And there was just like this bond that was formed that you can't fabricate. That I, we can sit there and we can, you know, go to games together and we can do all these different activities together. But the bond that you find where the Lord is working through you, and then I'm telling you about how the Lord is working through me in such beautiful moments, and it's like where the world just stands still, and we see the Lord doing a mighty work. And Mary's song is the beautiful display of the joy found when you're in God's plan. It should bring a song in our hearts and a song of praise. You look at, you look at Mary, and she says, let it be done, and Mary goes into a song of praise most women receiving that type of news would enter a period of stress. It's like, oh boy, saddle up. But she goes and she magnifies the Lord because she understands she's in God's plan. And my prayer in the same way, Lord, I just want to know I'm in your plan. Be it here, be it there, be it at this job, be it at another job. I just, I just want to know that I'm in your plan and then everything's at peace. Everything is where it needs to be. It says he has filled the hungry with good things. What are we hungry for this Christmas season? What do we desire for? Do we want a refreshment of God? Or have we grown immune to the holidays kind of, here's another Christmas. Here's another struggle. You know, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people entering Christmas, maybe for the first time that have lost a loved one this year. For the first time with different situations they're going through. And a lot of times we go through the motions because this and that didn't work out according to our great plan. If you guys can stand along with me. Again, the four, the four things that I want us to, to go about in prayer, not just in this little prayer after a message, but in consistency in these holidays... Um, and, and going into this new year is, does my lifestyle find favor with God? Do I desire to live a life that finds favor? Do I care more about my setup than I do the Savior? Is the Savior everything to me? And God's timing is focused on our character, not on convenience and comfort. Everything that we're going through, the different situations, some people greater trials than others, Am I willing to let God shape my character? Because that's what he's after. He's after your heart. He's after my heart. He's after your character, not to set you up in a comfortable way. And understanding that submitting to God's plan is the greatest decision we can make. Regardless of the ups and downs and the struggles and the trials, that's where we're the closest to God. That's where we feel fulfilled. That's where we feel hope. And that's why we're not like the outside. And one thing that I saw so profoundly yesterday as it was, you know, they had a lot of Christian songs and some not, was, was just the vanities without Jesus in the mix of it. Just, like, we're just going through motions, just fluffing each other up and probably leaving the building and going back to the depression and worthless. What is the point of life? And we have that access. And we have that beautiful thing where I know what Christmas is all about. I know why I'm here. I know what I'm made for. I know who made me. I know who sent me this precious gift. And at the end of the day, everything leads me back to the cross. As the birth of Jesus is basically, you know, the start of the new phase and leading us to something so much more. And we rejoice in that. So let's go into prayer and bring these things before God. Amen.